everybody. Welcome to the High Quality Fun Podcast. Today we have Greg, Greg Noble on, who is what the founder of Noble Downhill Racing, uh, which is longboard racing. Um, I found Greg on Instagram. Downhill and, skateboarding. Down, downhill down, down, hill skateboarding. Sk- skateboarding. <laughs> Let's get that clear right off the bat. Um, I, I found him on Instagram and immediately fell in love with this page because he just posts all these rad videos, clips of people racing, doing skate tricks. Uh, I I got my longboard, one of my longboards in the back right here. Um, used to used to longboard in college and high school. I busted three bones doing it, trying to learn to slide and everything. So I'm just excited to hear your tale and uh, bullshit with you for, for an hour. How you doing today? Absolutely. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm in Austin, Texas. And Thank God I get to wear a hoodie here. Finally, it's nice and chilly. It's probably here. snowed here in Michigan, so uh, it's probably getting chilly awesome. down there for you. Yeah, it's getting here. So yeah, thank you, thank you for having me. Yeah, cool. why don't you uh, why don't you just dive right in and tell us about yourself? Tell us a little bit of history of how you got into skateboarding and then how you sure. started that brand and uh, turned it into what you did. Yeah, yeah, it's a fascinating story. So. Uh, I come from a family full of velocity athletes. My mom was a uh, downhill skater. Um, and uh, she was the first actually female news producer for ABC News. So I grew up in uh, Boston and New York City. But then when I was about eight or nine, every Thanksgiving, she would say, all right, you're going to Nani and Grandpa's now. Annie Lucille died this year, so you're going to stay there a little bit longer. And every year I had an excuse. So all the other kids would go from Thanksgiving, come back, go to Christmas, come back, we go to New Year's, come back. I, starting in fourth, fifth grade, would be gone from Thanksgiving to New Year's. <laughs> and I'd be skiing. And my mom broke her, ba- broke her back right before the Olympics. And uh, she dated Billy Kidd. And Billy Kidd was the first uh, U.S. person to ever win a, a, he won a silver in the Olympics. So my mom having broken her back and never done it, decided my one son, so it's a single working mom. <laughs> uh, I'm out of state. Right now, because he's traveling for work. We might see a bunch yeah. of degenerates walking by from time to time. Yeah, de- definitely. High quality fun and degenerate skateboarders. <laughs> but uh, my, uh, my mom uh, decided that she would see if I had the gene. So I literally would go to my grandparents and ski just ski that's it and i come back to school and then when i was like in the seventh or sixth grade my mom's like all right you got it you're gonna you know, live in on grandpa so i just went there went to uh a ski academy and started uh skiing and naturally right then so i was living in stowe and bolton and that area and i was with the uh the burton boys were nearby so i started dabbling in skateboarding right away right away i mean i I just so but at that level even at that age i wasn't allowed to ice skate um i had to do soccer you know you couldn't do anything that could danger yourself well i was skateboarding and uh there was a georgia pacific lumber warehouse company like it was not you couldn't buy there was the train loads full of lumber as a transition point we would jump the fence we get the skateboarder magazine We'd look at what they were doing in in California. We're in Vermont. When we jump the fences, we get the you know four by eight sheets of plywood. We had the best ramps and balls. But every summer, I would break a bone for three summers in a row, and I would heal uh, ankle twice, uh, right clean through my shoulder another time. You know, um, and I loved it. And I was skating. I'll never forget. I had a Stacy Peralta warp tail um, with uh, Kryptonic trucks. And road rider wheels and uh no gold wing trucks and cryptonic wheels but anyways my my mom like by that next summer <laughs> i was falling in love with skating and snowboarding at its earliest never touched either one again and i was 13 14 and then when my son i had three kids when my youngest was 10 he saw a picture of me skateboarding and he said dad i want to skateboard and i was like so that was like 40 years <laughs> gone by and i said absolutely let's go get skateboards i was so excited it just like that little like ding, you know i mean just like a light so we went to a skate a skate store um uh skate place it was uh 
uh, what was Waterloo Records or something. We bought our boards. We went to Jim Hill Skate Park. My son was 10. I immediately went into like the bowls and like, it was like immediate, like boom. And uh, 10 minutes in, my son comes over and crying. And he says, I hate skateboarding. And what it was, <laughs> what it was is he's 10 and the six year olds were giving him shit. Now, if you're 10 and the six year olds are giving you shit, you don't want to do that sport. You, I mean, so, I mean, he was done, done. That was it. I hate skateboarding. Problem was I was like, vibratingly excited you know that skating and um i said well what about longboards you know i was just like trying to get him to do it so he went and uh but uh like two horrible boards you know at the time we didn't know i didn't know anything about it and we started longboarding and then we he picked it up right away so he was a velocity athlete it's like in the jeans you know you're a um you know, a mechanical athlete where it's like tick, 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 like skateboarding in a lot of ways, right? Or, um, you know, a velocity athlete doesn't do archery, right? <laughs> or synchronized right. swimming, you know, it's, it's, so, uh, so we started skating, we went in and started going to the garages at, during the daytime. And uh, I moved to the Heights in Houston and there's this shitty little store that had this plywood just like I had in Vermont on our ramps, like really a piece of plywood on the side where clearly the window had been broken and somebody had sprayed it, spray paint, and they sprayed a carve skate shop. It was the jankiest little thing. And I'm like, I saw a bunch of longboards out in front of the store. It was, I mean, literally it was the size of like Mary. I was in it. So my son, I pull over the car, my son, and I go in there. And the first thing they said, no, I'd moved from New York city to Houston. The first thing they said is leave those fucking pieces of shit outside the door. And I was like, what? <laughs> wow right you know i was like wow this whoa okay and there's like 10 five skaters six skaters and there was like Danny chubbs scotty like all the hardcore original guys in houston and by chance i stumbled into this scene i mean we were just pushing along a path and going to sit and going into the garages and then immediately was, what kind of board should we get and then and then i said yeah, my son and I have been skating in the garages during the daytime, and they we I thought they were going to beat us up. They said the no one. When you said when uh when Greg saying garages, they're talking about parking structures. You yeah, just, you go to the top, you ride all the way down, hit the elevator, go right back to the top. So Houston, there's a few cities in the U.S. Uh, Chicago, uh, Vancouver, up in but they call them parkades up in Canada. But uh, you know, we're not talking about two story garages here. We're talking, I mean, summer is 16 stories. Um, oh and, and every garage is different. The thing of it is like all of a sudden Houston for me, in my mind, becomes like Stowe or or Vale or, you know, you like find new trails, new garages, you find new, there are lefts, there are rights, there are spirals, there are like, it's just mm -hmm. massive. There are 26 garages in Houston that we skated. And the thing was you go garage hunting if you found a garage. And by finding a garage, we don't mean, oh, there's a garage. You got to figure out how to get into the garage. You got to figure out how how to work the elevator because you don't have a pass card. You got to figure out how to get through the door because you got to. These are not like public garages. The best garages mm -hmm. are the nicest companies. So yeah, so it be it became this cultural th phenomenon. So they got angry at us because we went during the daytime. We didn't know that there were rules. There were rules in in Houston on skating. If you got injured. Drag your ass out of the garage and tell them you got hit by a car. No one ever got injured ever at a garage. Because if you got injured in the garage and an ambulance came, there goes the scene. Shut down. Right? I mean, this was very underground. Um, hmm. You never went there uh, before midnight. You always had to have a helmet. There were just, and these rules were, <laughs> right? And then, uh, so one of the first races, the story goes, uh, so you, you, you stumbled upon that skate shop, and is that how you you learned about the garage racing? I learned that there was this other part of it, which started at midnight. And at the time, there was less than a dozen. Uh, yeah. And they not only skated the garages, my son and I just, oh, this is fun going down. No, no, no. I mean, it was like rugby, a game of rugby, but vertical. And the whole idea was, you know, grabbing, pulling, pushing, shoving. I mean, it was very physical. It's terrifying. 
And the reason is, is that people think, so it was full contact. And the reason that happened was uh, the garages, um, essentially, if you think about it, they're a constant pitch usually, right? So how do you gain speed? The only way to gain, and you're going too fast to push, right? To push your board. I mean, you're going pretty fast. But if you were to line six guys up in a row or six people in a row, and they all just stood there, you're pretty much going to go the same, right? But if you pull somebody, you're going to pick, they go slow, you're going faster. So it became <laughs> this physicality part of it was terrifying. But what it was doing at the time, I didn't even know it at the time, was it was unique to Houston. And it became a place where people were afraid to go. You, did, you know, if you're not a towner, oh, yeah, I heard about your garage scene here. <laughs> I mean, good luck. I mean, you're, there's so many classic stories, but yeah, so that was it. Um, we started having rate, you know, six turned into 12, turned into 20, just kept growing. Um, the team got started and the way the team got started is we were sitting on the car of couch one day and my son now is 11. So he's growing up in this scene. His mom and I got divorced. They were living out in the area. My other two kids were older. This was my youngest kid, like 10 years old. So literally there's hundreds of pictures of us of, six guys in a garage in this little top of the helmet. And that was my son, you know, and he, he ended up being six, six, six foot, but he, he grew up in the garages like four or five nights a week. My ex-wife would call and say, why is Dawson so tired all the time? <laughs> we're, we're staying until we're in the morning on a school night. And it's horrible. But, uh, Gosh. but, uh, so when that grew up, I mean, he loved it. You know, he loved it. He just was, Oh, and I loved it. And it just became this thing. And um, so, yeah. So my son said, how do I get sponsored? Because at the time, now longboarding was starting to go. So what, put in perspective, that started around 2009. Now it's like 2012. Started the team. And I'm usually started the team. No ball was my son would said to me one day, how do I get sponsored? Now, the idea of anyone in Texas getting sponsored was hilarious. I mean, on our side, like we got no respect. No one ever came to race just because they were scared. I mean, Carscape had even even in Houston put up a two thousand dollar like verbally out to the scene through Facebook, like two thousand dollars anyone who comes here and beats us, you know, like and no one came. So it just what was the scene it, like at the time? Because like I know there's a lot of downhill racers over in Europe and stuff, but right. is that what the scene's at at this point in time? So in what way? I don't understand. You said there's no skaters or no downhill skaters. Oh no, it's Texas. So this is a this was a time and a period where everything was SoCal. There were a lot of Europeans, there were a lot of Brazilians, but it was California. It was where you went, California or Portland or or up in Vancouver. But the idea that downhillers would come out of Houston, Texas, or Florida, or wherever it was mm -hmm. inexplicable. No one could like put those two together. And what happened was it was interesting. Um, some of the some of the better downhillers, uh, Rachel Rain, who went on the Sector Nine, Brian Courtright, Chubbs. Um, there's a lot of skaters that ended up going to California, ended up becoming like top downhill skaters because they learned in that hectic. It, you know, people didn't understand that it taught you how to make great turns, and you sure as heck didn't weren't scared in a pack. Because legitimate down and others don't touch each other. Yep. Um, so so when when that scene expanded to a point where we started traveling, you know, it's tough to break those habits in a garage when you're getting a little, you know, they say rub it is racing. Well, it was a little more than rub it. So there's, there, it, was, uh, it was fun in those early days. Um, yeah, so if anybody watches the videos of downhill racing, it's typically like if you're coming up on someone, you give them like a light tap on the back or, you know, whatever. There's no, there's no push and shove and pulling. Um, but what's, what's yeah. fantastic is, you know, when the Texans, so it grew out of Houston and we went to Dallas rivalries, you know, Houston against Dallas and they would say HDR rules, but HDR stood for Houston garage riders. So like Dallas was saying HDR rules and it's like, so it became this very boiling point. Uh, really, very, very, a lot of stories, man. Of like, there's a couple of videos. I, I think you might have seen one of them where 
we went to a Dallas race and right off the right off the start line, one of my guys grabbed one of the Dallas riders and threw him off his board right at the start line. Oh my god! <laughs> the garage, but no, but it, then T Noble. What ended up happening was I recognized that um, you know, kids, um, and and women were. I don't want to say marginalized, but it's but it's a pretty testosterone filled, like aggressive scene, and it's an underground scene, so it's very intimidating for somebody just to show up, you know, in a garage at one o'clock in the morning and try to hang out with these people that are literally. So, the team became an idea around um, kind of pulling everyone together, and uh, it just became this beautiful thing. I mean, it, it just like the only way you could get on the team is if you beat us in our own race. That's how you got a shirt. Once you got a shirt, you were on the team. And so it just became this really cool thing. Um, you know, there's a little hiccup there with Red Bull, but <laughs> that, 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 that was interesting. Um, my son came up with the idea to call it Team No Bull. And uh, he said at the time there was, you know, a, an energy drink company that wasn't looked upon too kindly by downhill skateboarders. And so we decided to make a shirt that was a complete knockoff from the Red Bull label. Instead of the ingredients, we listed the Houston garages, like in the ingredients. You know. And then for the uh, other ingredients, it was like, you know, it, uh, it increases performance. There are all these things in it. Um, and uh, yeah, it was pretty funny, but yeah, so Red Bull sent me a big old warning shot across the bow, and I had to do a cease and uh, desist, and I had to agree never to put any like this or anything ever on a board or on a shirt or anything. So I, especially, you know, I ended up going out and getting an exact replica of the Red Bull. That was her. Awesome. If you guys are listening, he's showing a tattoo on his arm of uh of the Red Bull logo on his arm. <laughs> Except it said two bulls, two, two skaters. Bull. Yeah, yeah, two skaters, awesome. no two skaters opposing. But anyway, so yeah, and it just grew and grew. So that's what happened. I, I mean, our, but there was a problem. The problem was that we were still breaking into garages um, at midnight, and that's fine when you've got ten people or twenty. But uh, ours got up into the hundreds of people. It, it it became this phenomenon, which none of us ever, ever expected. And sneaking 200 people into a garage at 1 o'clock in the morning next to the county courthouse is that's a little, a little tough to do. <laughs> the best garage was next to it. So uh, I said to Scotty at one point, I said, who's with Carve, and we were all doing this. So it really became Carve Skate Shop. And then Team Noble was kind of like the Carve group. Carscape Shop was in Houston and, uh, and in uh, Austin. And it just it became an incredible thing. It really did. Uh, we were viewed as like dirty racers and like aggressive. But, I mean, it was just full on racing, like very intense. Like it reminded me of, I, I, you know, the thing that fascinated me. I was a downhill skier, so I did downhill in college, and I also did um, a giant slalom. And I just was fascinating to me the the thought of having four or five downhillers next to each other like that grabbing each other. I mean, think about it. it, it uh, but uh, yeah, so we ended up, um, it just became this huge thing and, and it became too big for outlaw races. So I one day said, we should try and get it legal. And that was like considered sacrilegious. What do you mean legal? We should ask the garages if we could race here. And the thought of that was incredible because we were always getting, I mean, I bailed out a half a dozen teenagers throughout those years <laughs> out of college, excuse me, out of jail for trespassing. I mean, it was, and you know, you had roles. If you're injured, we, I literally dragged people. This is going to sound horrible. We dragged people out of the garage that got injured in the garage. These, you know, if they, the ambulance came to the garage, they're going to the garage scene. It was, a, so we protected the scene. That's the idea. Um, everyone wore helmets or all these roles, but, uh, so if you, I want to show you this clip. So, so what we ended up doing was we talked to two garages that we want to race at didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they were not keen on the idea whatsoever, you know, at all. Like, no way. Like, how do we stop you guys? It backfired, you know, like absolutely not. So we finally had this idea. It's like, wait a minute, why don't we, uh, why don't we go to hobby and like do a promo film? 
hobby was a hobby center in Houston. We'll film it one night and then we'll just show them, you know? So that clip that I sent you in the thing was the promo video. And uh, we, Scotty and I put on a coat and tie and we called Javi. We said we want to talk to him about an event. Didn't tell him it was skateboarding because that we learned don't face skateboarding. So we show up and they actually had the board because Javi said it turns out to be this like museum art performing center. So we're sitting there in this room with the board and uh, I'm like, Scotty, I don't think we should show the video. <laughs> but, but we... We, they, we, they said, well, what kind of event? And we're like, well, we want to do it in January. And they're like, January? Because this garage was used for uh, fireworks. Anyways, so we ended up showing that clip. And I'll never forget, it's a very, it's incredibly d well done. Because think about it, this was 2014, 15. Incredibly well done for that time. So the beauty of our team was, like I said, we were like a band, like we needed drummer. Let's get a drummer, so photographer. We need a graphic designer. We need a like we. The scene became this. This is an event machine. I mean, we could we could do two hundred racers get a race done in twenty eight minutes. We do six fifty three go ready go ready go. Like we were so dialed in, and what that meant is other events want us to come because we knew how to throw race throw races better than you know we. So uh, we show them this clip. And they're sitting there looking at like about five, 10 seconds and they go, that's our garage. <laughs> <laughs> and the, clip, the clip is like 15 of us just aggressively flying through this garage and beautifully done to music. And we go, yep. And they said, when does that happen? When do you, who gave you permission to go in the garage? Dude, nobody. And we said, that's what we do here every night. So it really was great. We said, so we'd like it legal, but we're already doing it. And one of them said, well, and this was beautiful. And they said, we're a public art center. So we have to by our creed or our, we have to, if you ask to do an event on the, these grounds, whether it's ballet or downhill skateboarding, we have to say yes. And it's like, we just, we had no idea. So they said, okay. And the thought of like doing that. So what happened was people would never come to our races from outside the state. Rarely. I mean, I'm talking maybe one pro racer every couple of years. And this turned into like an incredible thing for, for, for the scene, not for us, but for the scene. My, my, uh, that other clip I told you about the wheel based stuff, like they're literally, I will never forget. First off, the races were always in the nighttime. At one in the morning so now we had one the first race we did at night nighttime but like from like seven at night like we never went at seven at night we're like sleeping because we're gonna go to the garage at 1 a.m stay up all night yeah. yeah stay up all night you know and the second year they let us do it daytime and nighttime uh it's just there's so many great clips but the most amazing thing i ever remember is a six person heat on the top of the hobby garage legal Cops there, you know, just think, watching out ambulances, uh, film crews, reporters, hundreds of people like spectating. It was just epic, you know. And Hobby Center is right at the beginning of Houston. I'm getting choked up. It was just incredible. But I'm sitting there, I'm running the start line. I, and my rule was I never raced in my own races, which meant I never raced because they were all our races. But, uh, I'm sitting there and we would do it. We decided to go with six person heats. We decided to have one rule. We never had rules ever. There were no rules. That was the whole idea. Not you can do whatever you wanted. First man at the bottom or woman at the bottom wins. So all of our races were open, meaning anyone could do it. Men, women, kids, all together. No ranking, nothing. Just go. Like that was the beauty of it. I mean, we'd figure out the brackets randomly, but uh there was a heat, it was six people. I'll never forget it was James Kelly who at the time was one of the top, top guys in the scene. Louis Poloni, who was the head of downhill division at uh, Sector 9 in freaking SoCal. A eight-year-old boy, a father of an eight-year-old boy, and the 14-year-old sister, and then two of, two of our guys. And the kid, I'm like, you know, the race is ready, and the kid's just like this. 
like not even like the thing. And I'm like, hey, kid, kid, come on, get ready. And he turns to his dad. He goes, Dad, I'm racing against James Kelly. Like, <laughs> I forget That's that. Awesome. It was so awesome. That was a moment where I was like, we got something here. Oh my God, we got something. Like, because in downhill, race is proper. That will never happen. You know, downhill racing, not because they, it's not inclusive, because the structure of the race, you know, it's, the time trials and you know you're, it's different going 35 40 in a garage 60 70 in a race you know like a lot of the the structure of downhill racing is really to, so that doesn't happen so someone doesn't kill themselves you know you don't want an eight-year-old running in a downhill but the point is it, 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 it inspired the kid james was like blown away like wow this is incredible and you know the kid was from Houston and they get off the line and you immediately grab it. Like, it just, <laughs> you know, he, he, when he said I'm racing against James Kelly, I knew that kid is a grom. And I knew that grom when he met that I get to rip James Kelly. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, oh, yeah, man, so that's it, awesome. Yeah, it was very cool. Very cool. So the first year we won every podium men's, women's, groms. And then it was on. The next year, because there were stop stand for. Pardon me. What does Grob stand for? What is what stand for? You said men, women, and Grob. Oh, Groms, 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 Groms is G R O M S. That's anyone under under uh, sixteen. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So, so we had a Groms division. Yeah, sorry, that was something unique. Cause there's a lot of little tweaks. Uh, but the other cool thing about it is because of the inclusivity of it where we are in the scene right now within downhill, um, there are a lot of races and not enough women show up. And, you know, to even do a legitimate bracket, there's not enough young kids to do a legitimate bracket, you know? Because, so what we became was because of the speed was lower and it was in an enclosed place, not an open road, right? Um, there were aspects of it that were just natural to the, to the platform that made it okay for kids and women to show up and girls to show up. Um, and uh, what that created was women like Rachel Rain that ended up leading Houston. She grew up in the garage and skating with me and my son. You know, she was in her late teens, early 20s. She goes on to Cali and starts doing Sector 9, like a Houston out of the garages, you know. So it became a training ground. Because what was happening with my son, just like in that skate park when it's six year olds were making fun of him. So he said, I don't want to skate. You know, we got along work. What it became was that it, that place, right? Because if you're a 10 or 12 year old and you're looking at a downhill racer, you know, you're, how do I get there? Right? How do I go to 60? How do I wear leathers? You can't picture that, right? But it became that place. So it's very cool. So yeah, that's that's the story. So we ran the team went on, we went from garage races to running legitimate downhill. It got to a point where we were showing up in droves to Mary Hill, to Catalina, to Angie's Curse, to Ohio soldiers in Ohio. We started paddling this entire so it got to a point where they wanted us to come. You just keep in mind we were the band. So we would bring photographers, we'd bring, you know, it, when we showed up. It was all over Instagram, all over Facebook. That moment, we started live streaming. It just became a machine. So it was a very cool experience. Um, very cool. I mean, this That's is awesome. like, I, yeah, this I, is I, like. I know for me, like, oh, you're showing me your arm. Yeah, the downhill logo. Yeah, That's and awesome. then it also is on the back of my leg, right here. I saw that you. photo online. Yeah, nice. Yeah, That's so when we pass. And downhill talk, you know, like that. <laughs> that's that's why it's on that leg. Yeah, it just became this thing. So, so I was awesome. riding in, man, I graduated high school in 09. So I was probably riding like 09, 10, 11. Um, and Michigan's relatively flat. So we just went to like a, a little suburban neighborhood that had some hills and we'd go and practice there. Um, 
and I, I was like following all this scene on Reddit because that was like the only place you could really find anything. And there was just a longboarding page where people posted all these events, all these things. And, uh, um, and that was I, after I, I told this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, the only event I've really gone to was um, there was a longboard marathon, a push marathon. Oh, yeah. um, in Grand Rapids, which is like the west side of, of the state. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's close enough. I can drive out there. And so I drove out there and um, I had the endurance, but I didn't have the skill to like, you know, push with both feet evenly. Mm -hmm. Switch, um, push, yeah. Yeah, but it was it was great because you get there and you're actually seeing real longboarders out in, out in the wild, right? Instead of just interacting with them online and, and following all these posts uh, around the world. Um, yeah. So there's there's something interesting about that that I forgot to tell you. So the other thing that made that the Bayou Battle unique was it was the only event to this day that I know of. We did skate park, ditch, LDP, and garage race. All four of those. All of them in one in the thing. So the LDP side. Now there there's a classic example: velocity athlete versus this uh, endurance athlete, mm -hmm. you know? So it be, that's a thing. Um, but yeah, the push races to me and garage races are the two parts of our sport that, and, and slide jams, you know? Slide jams. The I had a slide jam after the event and just sure. my lungs were so blown out, I couldn't even get out there and ride, but it was great to just watch people bombing it downhill doing wild 10 foot, 20 foot slides, no gloves. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's nuts, but uh, yeah, I mean it's uh, so. I look back at that time, and I realize like when I now I look at the world differently, and I'm not saying that I or Houston or any of us change things, but we actually I am saying that we change things. Like it started with four or five people, and it grew to hundreds in a city for nothing else but like the culture and the thing and. And I will tell you that uh, to this day, so that was 2012. So this is like our 10 year anniversary it was kind of this year. Um, I kind of turned, I kind of unwound the team in about about a year before COVID because my son went away to college and all that. And like it became too much. I mean, it just became too much to handle. A lot of egos, a lot. Of, it just became this monster in a good way, not a bad way. It just became so much bigger i mean keep in mind start with three three kids three guys three women i had two t-shirts left because the minimum order was 11 or 12. it's like what what are we gonna do with the other shirts i just threw them in a drawer you know and i mean that's how it started so pure but the fact that that ldps and slide jams is it just brings people together and, and i'll tell you like to this day it happened to me yesterday I had somebody reach out to me who was in that one of the hundreds and he said, you changed my life. You know, at the time I was in a really bad place I, in that in itself is the beauty of skateboarding and downhill. And it, it's, it's anybody can do it. You know, you'll have kids from terrific backgrounds. And there was one kid there that every day I showed up at carve. I mean, I lived right down the street. You know, he'd be he'd be on the car cap sleeping, and then he always he was at every garage, every garage race. Finally, I realized like this kid's like homeless, like this is his life. He's sleeping on the car. He's eating there because we always order pizza. In. Like this is his family, and uh, that kid is now a man, grown ass man. And you know, he said like you that whole thing saved me. You know, I moved from the streets into a garage i guess you could say into the car counts but yeah it's just it's it's crazy how things like that happen yeah pretty cool so where we are today is like um i don't know where you want to go with this do you have any questions i mean i can i can talk forever man uh, I, no this is good i loved hearing the long form version of that story i kind of heard it before the podcast but hearing it explained that will spend that way is fantastic any, yeah. Anything grassroots like that. I mean, grassroots movements are huge and they're so cultural. Um, so I can definitely see that. And uh, I mean, just the way you told that, it kind of explains how big it got. Um, 
I don't care where we go with this. We can. Well, we can I'll just tell you. I'll tell you. Tell her. Yeah. So like, um, you know, so it kept growing and growing and, you know, it, and what happened was uh, it's interesting when I first started this, this being like when I first got involved in the scene all day, um, there are people that always came into the scene and left, you know, ebbs and flows would come in. And a lot of the times, the one of the reasons I think that we stuck and, and to this day, I, I, at least I hope I get respect, you know, people recognize me at least that I, I gave a lot of myself and everyone did. It's not about me ever. It never was. But, you know, people would come in and try and sell something, right? Or try and, and we actually had, I'll tell you this story, it's pretty, this is a great story. So if you go back to our Facebook page, you go all the way back to the beginning, we wrote a mission statement. So my background is I became an equity trader on Wall Street um, for a decade plus. I, I was a stock trader. I like in the shit, like not sitting at my house on the screen, like on the floor of New York Stock Exchange. So like I did that. The Gana Velocity athlete. I took no math classes, but I, I, I could, I love chaos. Like I operate well in chaos, you know, I'm calm in chaos. It's a curse, so it's not a blessing, believe me. It's not. But the point is that um, we ended up writing a mission statement, and it was written in stone. Like, it was Moses in the fucking tablets. Like, these are our rules. Okay, there are no rules in garage racing, but these are the rules of the team. And when it grew, but we had no idea where it was going to go. So one of our rules was we will never sell anything, we will never make anything. We will never lend our name to anything for a profit. All we produce is stoke. <laughs> and it was just that. Now, when that's nine people, it's pretty easy to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> but when you when you actually find out that you, it's becoming, it's shifting from a uh, grassroots, right? It's shifting from a three to nine people, it's growing in hundreds, and then you become recognized globally i mean that's you know it was fast people were fascinated by us and what we were doing because i mean it, we still had that same attitude well it was very hard not to we did we had a lot of things that were unique to us every flyer that we had was beautifully done if you go back and look at our flyers i mean they're just amazing that's all Jay Cronin. Jay that's Cronin all the design. sponsors that you guys had on those flyers oh, too you were just loaded up with uh loaded with, loaded uh, up Loaded no, boards, I mean, right? Our races had more swag, more gear, more stuff than any race in the world at, at one point because, again, the machine. We post, we tag, we, I mean, it's just, we went out. It just became, it's like, look at us. We're, we're in Texas. Pay attention. Like, look at what we're doing. Like, that was the original thing. Come race us. So, our first shirt, the Red Bull shirt, it said right here, it's a come race us. And on the back, it said, just pass you. <laughs> we yeah. had all these things like, <laughs> like his attitude, right? And uh, so we we hit this point where, like, I was spending a significant amount of not only my time, but personally my money. And I was okay with that. But, it, I mean, it became, I mean, you're throwing, it, when you're traveling across the country now and you're going to races and you're funding that, you're funding that, you know, I, I, I've i never talked about it. I don't, but I will hear. I mean, I was funding everything out of my pocket, everything as much as I could. The sponsors gave gear. The entire revenue model for the entire skateboarding scene for a decade was this. How are we going to pay for everything? We get the sponsors to donate gear. We have a raffle. <laughs> that pays for the race. And then within seconds of some, I'm not kidding. Within seconds of somebody winning something, they go on to buy, sell, trade on Facebook and sell what they just won in the raffle. It's it, no wonder, no wonder the manufacturers like could never get out of their own way because the more races there were, right? The more gear was given, the more gear was given, the more three hundred dollar boards were showing up. Literally two minutes after someone won it for a hundred bucks. <laughs> oh, I mean, like it became this churn. At least it's a theory of mine when it really grew. But but thank goodness for the sponsors because they created because they're the skateboarding itself, having come from skiing, I and having worked on Wall Street for 30 years, uh, I'm like, what an incredible scene. Shittiest business model I've ever seen in my life. There's no way it's ever gonna go anywhere. 
Um, and, and you know, no sponsors, no corporate sponsors, right? And the skate companies, who's running the skate companies? Skaters, you know, like, so like, it's just, it was beautiful, but there's not a lot of, you know, there's not a lot of money in that model. Um, skaters would get old and get married. That brand's done. <laughs> I mean, that would happen, literally. I, what happened to Big Myth? Oh, you know, he, he ended up, you know, move, move, get married or whatever, moved. Um, so we got approached. So we we can't sell anything. We can't do anything. So we got to a point where, like, brands were hunting us down, like, really wanting us to, like, you know, do and They were giving us their uh, – because, it, again, the only outlet was Instagram, Facebook, and we were flooding it. Like, a race would be flooded. it, you know. We're very, very cognizant and grateful that they're, they're part of it. So – the funny part of the story is so I, I still had this lingering hangover from the Red Bull thing. And uh, so we changed the logo for, to, we thought it would be smart to change the logo. Well, we had to change the logo. Well, what do we change it to? Well, we had a racer on our team, Stevie D, Stevie Dubain. And there was, this, he just had the most beautiful, epic, perfect puck. You know, like that was his thing. And um, so Stevie had, uh, let me just do one thing here. So Stevie had, uh, a certain talk to him. So <laughs> he just made so it that, love it. Yeah, yeah. So that was our logo. So our first logo was that, right? Then that's a Red Bull, almost identical. And then our next logo was that, right? So we went with that's a mobile mobile, mobile show. Yeah. Pegasus, but it's a downhill skater with that's wings. Perfect. Yeah, so that became our new logo. And that's what's on my thing here. So it's a beautiful logo. It's very clean. And it's just, that's all Jay Cronin. Like he designed it. So we ended up getting contacted by Moonshine. So Moonshine at the time was a unique board, uh, compressed, like foam. It, it was waterproof. It never warped. It was, you know, they're great boards. At the time they were, it was like loaded rain. And then Moonshine was a new kid. Land yacht was the most pure wooden ones. They built the they built the best board ever made in the world, which was a 2011 uh, Wolf Shark. If anyone is listening to this, one. I remember the, that that name at least. Yeah. If anyone here is listening to this and they have a 2011 Wolf Shark in good condition, name your price. I need one. I want one so badly. It's the best board ever. I I gave my board away to a kid that needed it, but now I'm. Regretting, but anyways, Moonshine. Uh, we were on our way to Mary Hill. They said, "Hey, we want to talk to you." So they said, "We'd like to do a board. We'd like to change the talker in to make it the Noble Talker." And that's what I'm like. So they said, "Look, we're going to give you X per board." Like, I forget the number. Let's say hypothetically, I know what it is, but I don't want to say. Let's say hypothetically, the boards were 180, 200 dollars, something like that. And they were offering me like twelve dollars or more, right? And at the time, the only thing we had out there was our shirts. And then every race, our flyers, and every race we had a different sticker that said the day of the race on it. Became a thing of gold. You put on your helmet. Like I was, every race had a sticker that for the day of the race. So all of our races were like Bayou Battle, um, uh, no bull, no crying, no prisoners, no whatever. Like it became this thing. So, Moonshine proposed it to us, and I and I and I literally said to uh, the guys in the team, "They're like, well, we can't do that. We can't accept money." You wrote <laughs> eight years ago. You wrote we can never accept money or anything. Meanwhile, I'm like a lot of money in the hole on this thing. I'm like, oh shit, like. <laughs> so, I had I brought the board. I had one of the uncut ones. So this is what they did. Beautiful board. Yeah. And then you can see, so what I'm showing you is the back of the board. They even did the grip tape. Of the Texas the symbol. Name. Yeah, the Texas symbol. They had this DVD. And I came very close to I had to do it. <laughs> we put in the red we put in the red bull with the ingredients, the writing facts. And so we told them, I mean, it's beautiful. When they showed us this with the red, we were like, oh my gosh, most beautiful board. Yeah, we we're like, oh wow. So, what are we going to do? So, what we did was we only made 26 of them 
There are 26 people on the team, and each person on the team got a board. You could not buy it. The sales of the Moonshine Tucker went up like 1,200%. They oh bought God. the Tucker without, without, and I'm sitting here going, oh, my God. <laughs> and I ran the numbers when they told me how many Tuckers they were selling without our logo on it, without our logo, just because of that. And that's what I realized. And I don't mean this as egotistical as it sounds, but it's kind of a rule of business. If you own the brand, you own the market. You know, um, I realized, like, wow. Like, what do we have? Um, it just, it's pretty wild. So what I did was, uh, I want to, don't want to, like, there's so many stories around that, but, yeah, you know, like, so the Tucker, like, this is unmounted, but now ting. <laughs> I dropped it. But, uh, you know, like, that became, it's like gold, that, that board. Like, yeah, I mean, I've been offered ridiculous amounts of money for, for that thing. But I never saw it. I, I had four of them recently. I gave away to some people in the scene that are important. But uh, it's funny. Um, it's it, it just got to that point. So my son goes away to college. Um, a lot of things go on, just drama and around the team, like who gets to be on it. So we had to change the rules. Originally, the rules were the only way you made it on the team was if you beat us in a race. And then you got a shirt. Like that was the whole thing. But then the problem with that is it, it started to become that's kind of exclusive, right? Because mm -hmm. so we started to open it up. And so then we had a nomination process. We had a total closed page. And I thought it was a great idea. You know, like you, you could nominate and then it had to be second and third. And, but it still became like we were sliding in. We started sliding into the pros, the best rate. You know, like we started stacking the team, you know, <laughs> like, like, oh, let's get that guy. Like, you know, or that was. And uh, so it kind of lost its path a little bit. And then um, so I decided I moved to Breckenridge, Colorado, when my last, my youngest son, this, the skater, went away to college. Um, I left like within a week is it go back to my skiing. But I also went, I moved to Colorado also because that's where the big, that's where the big races are. That's leathers, 14,000 foot with, you know, very thin air and leathers. I mean, it's next level speed, you know? And uh, I decided to walk away in a sense, like step back from the team. So I had this, I that I, we had this massive machine and I, within like weeks, if not days, it stopped the minute I stopped. It was pretty surprising. Hmm. Uh, and by stopped, what I mean is we never, it, we were we were an organization and maybe I was who I was, like all the pieces fit together, right? But when one piece came away, I'm not saying it was all me, but you know, when I left and this left and that and it just kind of stopped. So it stopped and then more recently the reason you found me and people were there and we're starting to go up again is I, I realized like that moment that wasn't because it was two thousand and nine, that was a purpose uh, driven effort that worked, right? So like why, doesn't matter where we are and what brought me back into where we are now is after, you know, isolation, right? From COVID uh, led to depression, led to tribalism, led to all this stuff, you know, this weird thing. But I remember coming out of COVID. So for example, I started to Liam Morgan recently and some of the other guys that don't skate companies now. So Liam has Caliber and Prism and uh, Blood Orange Wheels. I mean, their sales, like sales for downhill skateboarding, were the greatest they ever ever have been in the history of the sport on a sales and numbers side during COVID. During COVID, oh, I I would not have thought that, but that it's like everything yeah. else. I mean, shit, everyone's buying campers. We went hiking over. A, Fourth of July weekend and the whole yeah. trail was populated because everyone was you, you, get outside. So where we are right now is you know again. So I'm involved right now in startups and funding companies and like you know all kinds of things. Um, is you know I'm, I, I help ideas go to you know real deal. I, I do a lot of things I, uh, in the investment banking, capital markets. That's I've taken my skills and my biggest thing has been shit. Like this whole time, no one. 
knew I was a skier, like like for the longest time. I never told you I was a skier. I was living in Texas, so I'll never forget when I moved to Brackenridge. And I literally was, you know, at one point, like one of the best skiers for my age. Like, you know, I mean, I'm a good skier. I'm the best skier I know, put it that way. So, <laughs> um, so I'll never get moving to Breckenridge. This is about six years ago, five years ago. And I'm on a chairlift with, with three downhillers. And they're like, I, <laughs> so funny. Going up, I'd never said anything. They're like, hey, this is a pretty tough slope up here, Greg. Are you going to be okay? Is this like, and I'm sitting there in the chairlift going, oh my God. I, I, I no one knows. Because <laughs> I don't, like, I'm talking about myself here now. People think I talk about myself all the time. Mostly I talk nonsensical gibberish you know but uh yeah i'm like oh shit they don't know i'm a skier like i'm a good skier but it's so my point is like boom they're like oh wow You're like what you know and uh that's a velocity athlete but that Breckenridge experience turned into a skate house if you go back like it was outrageous but so in breck we started getting involved in big boys you know no gender specific but just big races right and started getting in and when I realized coming out of the other side of COVID, like to your point, campers, uh, you couldn't buy a snowmobile anywhere in the United States right after. You couldn't buy a jet ski. You couldn't buy anything. I have friends of mine that are now from Team No Ball, are free climbing Yosemite, are base jumping. Like people lost their fucking mind after COVID in extreme sports. And our world, has become like a fascination and everyone wants a piece of it. And, you know, it's interesting that the average age for a youth getting their driver's license for history has been like 15 and a half. As of this past month, it's 17. 17 is what the average age is. So what the heck's happening? What's happening is everyone wants an experience. They want to feel it. You know, they want to, they want to like feel something. Um, advertising now is just spitting the bed on traditional means. And yet you throw an event, you know, you, you, there's not a single music festival or anything that's not like AT&T or Verizon or, you know, whatever. Um, so what's happening is, you know, there's Gen X, Gen Z, and now there's the next generation. And all they care about is, experiential that's it they want to feel it touch it see it and it's it's remarkable to me how as as somebody who's very involved in the stock market his whole life everything always it's history you can go back and see it always goes the same way you can always plot it you know like this and what we're seeing right now is essentially the same platform or situation that happened with team noble back today so my point is like we've got a, an opportunity right now we being the sport to get off just Instagram and start throwing events. The ironic thing is there is one Burt contest, one, the most exciting, the two most exciting sports. And I, I would argue with anyone to argue against it, but Burt in skating, you know, the mega ramps and downhill skateboarding, show me anything that's, that has that level of not only skill, art, um you know danger um i i have i've lost her you know i've known someone who's not you know died in a sport and i also know one of a just beautiful person candy dungan you know she's paralyzed but for the rest of her life she's one of the top female writers she hit her guard, guard rail in colorado several years ago and i was living there at the time and you know so it's a very dangerous sport and when we came out of COVID, yes, sales were up, but the event organizers of which they were mom and pop, like the event you went to, you said in Michigan, right? Uh, there was a time in our sport where literally every weekend of the year we had a, so every weekend, every weekend. And for USA skateboarding for downhill, so downhill just made it into the part of USA skateboarding, which is governing body, which goes to the Olympics. So we're like just there. You know, we're right there. Same thing with Bert. Bert is, you know, I, I, I cannot understand for the life of me. Nothing against skateboarding. I love skateboarding. Skateboarding gave us downhill. But for the life of me, I, I break dancing is in the Olympics. <laughs> Flag football. Come on. Come on, man. You got to be kidding me. 
and this stuff, downhill skateboarding. And uh, so there's never been a time in my career of I'm taking a new approach. So I want to shake things up. And I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to shake it up. And by that, I mean the iconic events we used to have, which are Pikes Peak, Cathlamet, Catalina. These are events that are just unbelievable events, are gone. The media platforms that we used to have, you know, you, you talked about Reddit. Yeah. I mean, we, we used to have Skate Site, Wheelbase, Skatehouse Media. Oh, my God. Louis Poloni, Max Dubler, and those guys, the stuff they put out. Um, push Culture, which is this, which is also this. I remember Push Culture. I forgot about that. Push Culture with the Davenport Twins. Oh, my God. The most brilliant approach to events. So my point is, like, the whole scene. So what do we have now? We have old guys like me, um, you know, and then we got guys like Louis Pelosi loves to say, he said, I'm your favorite skater's favorite skater. <laughs> he said, um, and then you've got guys, beautiful, wonderful, just like, thank God they're still in the scene, guys, like Bryson up in Canada, you know, like Dino and Mary Hill, like, you know, Pap Dog and, uh, in Colorado. And I could go on and under the guys that are just, you know, keeping the flame alive. Um, you know, guys like Reimer and his events. Um, there's there's these guys, so uh, soldiers, the oldest, best, most incredible race in the world in the middle of nowhere in Ohio. You know? Um, yeah, what is so that one? We, I'm, I'm in Michigan, so, like, I need to get down to oh, whatever this Ohio event is. Oh, my God. It is the most incredible. It, it, to me, it's, it's so soldiers. The greatest story about it is it used to be called Demons of Downhill. It was what it was originally called. And no one even knew about the hill, let alone the races. But back in the 80s, it was the 80s, 90s, it was loose race, loose race, street loose. They literally had like a hundred street losers. And this this one place in Ohio, Bainbridge, Ohio, it's in Amish country. So at every race before the race, it's the most incredible thing. It's always in the fall. It's been going on now for decades, and it it, it changed to um, it changed from demons to soldiers because uh, the uh, I got I'm trying to look at the story because soldiers was a never summer soldier board and the first guy to ride to ride that hill again had a never summer soldier, mm-hmm. and he ended up calling it. Um, he ended up calling it uh, soldiers. So it's just wild. So that, I'm sorry, that, that was Dan Oliver. So Dan Oliver was one that brought that back. And, and that race is in the fall and it's iconic and it's got the most incredible track. And there's a clip that I put up recently. It's just intense. But my point is, it's in Amish country in the men nights. And I've never seen anything like it. it at the beginning of every race, before the racers come down, I'm not exaggerating. 40, 50 of them come with their, you know, the blacks and the, top, the black suits and the top hats. And then the women are all in the Amish gear on their bicycles, like 40, 50 of them on their bicycles, bicycling up, up the, uh, up the hill to go watch the race. It's the biggest thing there. It's the biggest thing that ever happened. So, you know, they have no power. They ride the horses and they come and watch the race. And this year, what was really special was we um, we ended up uh, in a so that everyone camps outside. It's a total. So our thing with T Novo was win the win the party. That was our our thing. Win the party, not win the race. Win the party. So uh, that was something we we were very good at. But as I got older, I found that there was a, a slew of camp cabins. Uh, so anyways, the point is, uh, I was with Morgan Smith, and um, we stayed there at these cabins, and no kidding, man, this one family had six boys, six boys, and by the end of the weekend, they were so stoked about um, skating and the fact that the racers were all staying there. We got them all boards, all six of them boards. We got them all. I, I gave them T-Noble shirts. And, like, 
I've never seen like so. And then there was a couple. There was a, a couple gir- girls in town that said they want to do it. We got them boards. So it reminds me of the garage racing. Like you know, it's like just reaching just a little bit outward, and and you can grow the sport. And, and the only way you can do that is through events. So what I'm doing now is we're no longer Team Noble, as you notice. It's Noble downhill. And it's not even noble in the old side. And if you go to nobledownhill.com, I don't know if you've seen that, but we've got a website up there. Yeah, um, I have a pull and, up right here. Yeah, so if you look, there's some hints on there. There's actually a page that says tickets or <laughs> events, or t- and it says TBD. Um, and this is the first time I've talked about this, by the way, publicly. And so those TBDs are, are they're going to become what, you know, it says there, I think it says what, Colorado, Vermont, California, Europe. I mean, so, I, I mean, I know one thing for certain, and that is the only way to get people involved in the sport, the only hope for the sport is to have more garage races, bring back garage races, bring back races, bring back iconic races, bring back iconic brands, bring back, like, the, literally, we know what the formula was, right? We saw it. Um, so that's my mission. Um, and in that, during that mission, I'm, you know, coordinate, I'm talking to USA skateboarding. I'm talking to anybody to listen, you know, I'm not trying to run anything, not starting league or anything, but you know, it, it the, it's easy, you know, it, it's a culture. Uh, it's the most beautiful uh, group and community I've ever been around in downhill skateboarding and skateboarding just in general. I mean, it's, and I say in general, not to minimize, it's just, it's so accessible. It's a kid to board. Like that, that's my story, right? My son in the board. That's it. And you know, I mean, became amazing. So yeah. So sorry, I'm getting off track, but um, I mean, I don't know where where I'm going. I don't, I don't know what we're doing, but I do know that um, that there are so many guys that are maybe in their fifties or forties that I've talked to that were part of that scene that are now successful in their own right and careers. And it was interesting when I started thinking about this, I was like, man, I wish we could bring back this or that. So a couple of things happened that really sparked me. One is obviously downhill skateboarding going under USA skateboarding Olympics. And, and I ended up having the, I'm so grateful and humbled, but I ended up being able to uh, this past couple of weeks, hang out with, you know, Johnny Scheffler and, um, Brandon Lowry and Cole Kurtz, and these are all the big, the top people within USA Skateboarding. And you know, just I a month ago, I I literally went to the U.S. Luge and Bobsled team and sat with the actual Olympic Bobsled team and Luge team. So what I've been doing is like it's amazing. Just like when we got approval to do that garage race, all, the whole time, all we right, we just showed up and they're like, yeah, we have to have you here. Um, it's just funny how barriers exist because people just never asked, right? I never asked. Like, Can we do this? Sure. It's like, no one ever asked. I mean, literally the U S luge guys said to me, yeah, in 1990, we asked luge if they wanted to be part of it. I'm like, what? It's just, you know, it's amazing that people build barriers in their minds when they're just, all you have to do is poke it, you know, and something happens. So, uh, I'm helping, um, I, I, I was so grateful to hang out with Brad and Brad Lowry and all these major guys in our sport, right? Um, Brandon was uh, head of uh, the World Surfing League, and now he's head of USA Skateboarding. And, and it's like they're so open. They just – it's board sports. At the end of the day, it's just all board sports. Yeah. That's, you know, it, it doesn't matter. You know, there's a board. Except, except, I just have to say, one wheels – I hope they burn in hell. Like one wheel should not be allowed. I think they are absolutely, they're not a board. Um, it's just, I, those things need to go away. Razors. That's not a board. There's a couple of exceptions to that. No, but, uh, so yeah, I, I mean, where I see this going is I'd love to see more vert events. And what I'd ultimately love to do is have a mega ramp vert at the end of a downhill race. You know, put oh those two sports. But that too, I, I actually would love to have a vert ramp on the top of a garage and, and then do it there. And all that's possible. I'd love to have live streaming from top to bottom, literally 
No one, think of this, true story. No one has ever seen a downhill race from top to bottom in the history of the sport, with the exception of Andy's curves that did it, and some follow runs, sure. But I talked to a very prominent person at a very, at a very large company in marketing about our sport. She called me back the next day and she goes, why, why, are all the, why are all the films of all your writers' asses? <laughs> <laughs> I've never thought about it. I go, what? She goes, every single rider, we never see their faces. They got really cool helmets. And but all I'm looking at is everyone's asses. And I said, Wow, I had really and why did she say that? Because outside she said most of the sport I've ever seen in my life, but why do I have to look at everyone's ass? <laughs> That's funny. It's because of follow cars. It's yeah, the only yeah. way you can build. Or a rider behind them with a on a GoPro stick. Yeah, or she said, or I can see what's in front of him, but I don't see what's going on. Why? Because the GoPro's under helmet. No one's ever seen. Think of it. No one's ever seen the perspective of right there, right? And I will tell you this: I've been in, I've, I've raced, I've been in races, I've watched races from top to bottom, I've run races. Everyone goes to crash corner, right? What's the prerequisite of every race? Really long, really fast ends in crash corner where everyone. Is, that's the entire race is that last corner, and it's a shit show. People, people can be seriously injured. It's got to be a big corner, so you put all the people. That's the design of a race. But ninety percent of the race happens on, this, on the, the the mental games these guys play and women play with each other at start line. I've seen it. It's crazy. It's intimidating. And there's so much that goes on. And going down, you know, 60, 70 miles an hour within inches of each other in a pack and the drafting and the passing. It's it's like incredible. And I've seen pieces of it, and I, there have been some races that are top to bottom. But imagine if, like, that noble downhill, like, if we had a technology where literally every race was, like, filmed top to bottom, right? The technology is there right now. You can go to freaking Walmart for 40 bucks and buy a drone. You know, this thing right here, by the way, has LiDAR in it now. Every, every phone, this generation, has LiDAR. What's LiDAR? It's it's geotagging down to the set down to, down to centimeter. So like we you know the big thing in our sport is like the timing system. Oh my god, fire! It's like invented fire. He's bringing a timing system. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm sorry to laugh, but to me, at age fourteen, I got discovered, and that guys, I'm sixty. That was a long time ago. At age fourteen, somebody said, "Who's who's who did the thirty six and." 82 100th time. Oh, that was Greg Noble. How old is he? He's 13. He's beating the 16 year olds. Like, that's how I got found. Because it was just a timing system. No one was in it. I'm just tripping a gate and going, it's not difficult to time. It's not a big deal. It's actually, our sport is literally, and no offense whatsoever to Miles, who does the timing. Mean, no, I'm just saying where we are technology wise is amazing. And yet our sport isn't using any of it. So, what I'm saying is, you could literally have a race without a timing system and you could have it all live streamed directly to a platform at the Instagram, right? Which is 10 second clips and crashes. I mean, yeah. the, and it's just incredible. I mean, I could go off on this, but I see an enormous opportunity, but the only way to do it is pull, is pull it all together. Not like a race here, a race there. You know, it's got to be a boom. Like, you know, and there has never been any significant outside money that's coming to our sport from an outside corporate sponsor of any kind to speak of. Red Bulls come in and got out. You know, they come and go. But that's because no one can figure out. Like, leagues start going up, this WDSC or whatever it is. Um, so, you know, it's, it's they're, they're doing it all about the content, but the races are, you know, just... They're not all, you know, there's been a lot of crashes, some serious injuries in it. They're all about content, you know, and then it's just incredible. But the, I mean, I could go off and I don't want to get into all that. Like, <laughs> I don't care about like any, anything. Uh, my idea is I just want to bring back the sport more people skating. But I'll tell you, here's two tells, okay? So, so when you're a, an equity trader, you look at something or whatever, right? You look for signs, right? Or cops, things going on that, oh, look at that. So two things have happened that I think are very significant. One is 
Pirates Downhill, which used to be called Guadalajara in Puerto Rico, is coming back this February 24th. Anyone watching this, if you're not a skater, doesn't matter. You got to go. You have to go to Pirates Downhill in Puerto Rico. It is the most unbelievable, idyllic, sketchy, incredible shit hell of a race you'll ever see. It's through the streets of Puerto Rico. There's thousands of people that come out to this. It's like nothing you've ever seen. It's it's incredible. It reminds me of like Catalina or Castlevet up in Washington, but it, but the Puerto Ricans and they know how to party. They know how to, and it's just crazy. So Guadalajara is coming back after years, after five years. That's this February twenty fourth. What else is happening is the Broadway bomb. Have you ever hear about that? Yeah, in New York, right? So it's it's like- right. They, they don't even get permission, right? They literally just go and ride Broadway from start to finish, is, through traffic and everything. Yeah, from Manhattan and back to me, back to your LDP story. So that at, at one point, push culture was bigger than that. It literally was thousands of people, and the whole the the, the, the race. I love it. The race flyer has a bomb on it. It says Broadway Bob, you can die. <laughs> that oh was my the, gosh. That was the actual promotion for it. And uh, so the runway bomb was literally the New York City police force. There are years that, that uh, where they were bringing out barriers and the whole thing. And they didn't understand. Yeah, yeah there's videos of people like skirting, hopping the barriers. Just going, and yeah, I mean, like, what are you kidding me? You can't do that. You can't stop it. It's funny. Same thing garages. So next year, for the first time ever in the history of Broadway bomb, they got a permit. From a hundred and six, uh, from the all the way up in nineties, all the way to the bottom, the entire Manhattan Broadway is going to shut down for Broadway Bob. Wow! So things, things like that. That's things like that. Imagine the accessibility in a city like Manhattan for the sport, for the exposure. Now, you know, next year the two things, the two things you, the three things you, four things. I can't look through it. But if anyone is interested in the sport, and if it, you're regionally anywhere near this. To see what is the most incredible sport, most incredible people, most incredible party, was just everything about it is amazing. Is uh, Mary Hill? Yeah, it's three times a year, four times. It's unbelievable. It's a road to nowhere, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it was built for the Queen of England visiting, uh, uh, visiting, you know, uh, the U.S. to go and look at this thing called pavement and the car, and they built this. Road perfectly banked, perfectly good, and it's incredible. So, Mary Hill is what you have to go to Soldiers in the Fall with the leaves changing in Bainbridge, Ohio. is the most incredible event I've ever, it's just beautiful. Dan Oliver said, uh, Broadway Bob, oh my gosh, it's incredible. Anyone can do it. Skaters are doing it, you know, like rollerbladers, like it's it's an absolute shit show, but it's so great to watch, be a part of. And it's actually a race. People don't know that. It's, it, they kind of there is a winner. Um, so yeah, that's um, yeah. There's some great events out there from Kevin Reimer and the Jim and Rib and the the free rides out in South Carolina, North Carolina. But so there, there's thank God there's a few events there, right? Like, but uh, you know, I I want to bring back garage racing. I want to bring back events that used to be, or you know. Um, I want to, I want to, because what's happened right now, because the gap of COVID, because those magazines disappeared, I'm still better about that. Um, because these things go away, there's actually, it's like people look at it like, oh, our scenes died. There's not this stuff. No, it's a, we got a clean slate. Like, this is beautiful. Like, literally a clean slate. You can bring all that stuff back tomorrow. What do you need money? But the thing is, is, have you seen the wonderful world of sports right now we have? We have cornhole, axe throwing. Uh, <laughs> we have slippy slide. We have chase tag. We have drone racing. Oh, and then the derivative of axe throwing. We actually have knife throwing. Um, and, you know, of course, we have the James Coney Island uh, hot dog eating contest. It's just it's yeah, unbelievable. It's, no, but it, I'm being funny, but it's actually true. Those are... Right. So the uh, so Cornell just got private equity money in and and like oh we got pickleball sorry pickleball we got to talk about pickleball I mean what the hell 
uh, it's just it's so you know you're laughing, I'm laughing. It, it is actually humorous. How does something like vert like there's this terrific kid TJ Titus who's good and wants to vert bring vert back? You know, there's only one vert contest a year now. It's X Games. You know, um, so yeah, I mean, look, I gotta tell you something. If a bunch of uh, you know the sponsors for Cornell is like Johnson sausages <laughs> i mean come on and they have like i think something like a 1140 hours of tv time on espn you gotta be kidding me i mean uh anyways anyways i i digress i go off but you know here's the here's the thing also what's no, that no, I was, I, go ahead I'm, I'm gonna probably wrap it up in a minute since we're yeah, no uh, worries I, I just want to say that what's happened what happens in that when you don't have it inclusivity, what are the what are the ones that suffer? The ones that suffer are the ones that either can't afford it, or sadly, the young kids and the young women and the women um, get you know that it's it's intimidating, sport, it's difficult, barriers to entry. But you know, I want to bring it back so it's all inclusive. I want to you know do all of that. So yeah, I mean, I, I just I'm so I love the sport with a passion. Um, sadly, I've injured myself brutally over the last decade, and I'm having a very difficult time even. Thank you. Shout out to Will Royce for giving me a e-board. I, I, you know, it's like, not giving me, I, I got it for a fair price. But uh, I started thinking about it. It's like, wait a minute. You know, it, I feel like if I got an e-board, I'd be like those those old people at Walmart that get in the shopping carts, right? <laughs> If I start doing the eboard, but uh, no, that's it. And, and I'll just tell if anyone's watching this, if any of this touches your point, if you want to do the sport, you want to know about the sport, if you want to anything, like if you want to sponsor this, I mean, I, I'll tell you, it just takes a spark. And I've done it, I've seen it, you know, it just takes a spark. But uh, so if anyone has any interest whatsoever on Instagram, uh, please, uh, Noble Downhill Skateboarding. And then we have a website. Uh, which is uh, Noble Downhill, N-O-B-U-L-L. -L. But uh, yeah, I, man, thank you so much for the time. I, I, I just love it. Um, Honestly, like this was this was way better than I expected. Like just hearing your full story, letting me sit back and listen for an hour, like hearing yeah. from start to finish that story is incredible. Yeah, I, I, um, I don't get, get much of a chance to do it. Um, yeah, well, well, it's like definitely reminded me of... Uh, you definitely brought up some things that I completely forgot about since I haven't been riding in so long. These See, I've got a set. You know. Yeah, I've got a broken back and a separated shoulder. <laughs> Hold on, I got to say. Yeah, I busted a collarbone and my wrist. I got plates and screws in this wrist, all from longboarding. It sounds like you've broken almost every bone in your body throughout the years. And what, you're 50 years old now. Thank you very much. I'm 60. Um, but um, 60. yeah. Uh, as my friend says, but I'm 34 and tender. I know that's creepy, but I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but one of the things I want to show you is, uh, so these are all injuries, <laughs> all the tattoos. Oh, my represent, gosh. Represent an injury. And if you ever get a chance, so this is Jay Cronin. This is, um, has all the turns. But anyways, I have, this is when I broke my back. This is Jesus Cinco. Shout out to him. <laughs> It's the ugliest tattoo I've ever had, but it's, he called me out. He's in Amsterdam. But look, I'm going to leave it there. I'm tired, but man, thank you for the platform and thank you for uh, your time, really. I, I had no idea what to expect, but uh, it's funny. I've got like six skaters making funny faces at me here. <laughs> I love but uh, yeah, man, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I'd love to do this again sometime, but maybe, uh, you know, or I could suggest some others. But yeah, it's guys like you and doing things like this and reaching out that really we need we need more of that, you know. So. Oh yeah, thanks a lot, Greg. I'll I'll be in touch with you, but uh, you have a good night. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. Bye now. Thank you for listening to the High Quality Fun Podcast. If you guys enjoyed this show, please give us a follow. And if you have a good story or just want to say hi, feel free to reach out to us on Instagram or YouTube. Thanks for listening.